Now, I, I wanted to talk about Vigano's latest talk, at least the one the latest one that I know of. It was a talk he gave at a university in France about two weeks ago. And it, but it just appeared on LifeSide News in English uh, two days ago. And um, all I'm going to do is read Vigano's um, talk. So let me just read this. And I put the link up to the full talk on the description beneath today's show. Okay. Conference given by Archbishop Vigano at the Summer University Civitas in France on August 14th. Happens to be the feast day, by the way, of um, Maximilian Kolbe. When human beings act, they do so with an end in view. Man's action, what he does, represents a means to an end, which may be morally good or bad. No one acts without a purpose. And even what has been happening before our eyes for more than two years now, that's a reference, of course, to the pandemic, to the Great Reset, to the conflict in the Ukraine and so forth, is the consequence of a set of concomitant causes that presuppose an initial thought in informing principle, so to speak. And when we realize that the reasons given to us to justify the actions taken are not rational, it means that these reasons are pretexts, false reasons, which serve to hide an unmentionable truth. Just general principle here, right? No one acts without a purpose. And if the rationale that people give us for what the purpose was is irrational, for instance, let's say they say that lockdowns were to prevent the disease, you know, more disease from spreading where the lockdowns didn't do any good at all, or that the, um, you know, that the war or the, the, um, NATO involvement in the Ukraine was to end the war when it, you know, just prolongs the war, whatever it is, when the reasons they give us are not rational, they're not reasonable, then they must be giving us those reasons to hide their true motivations. Um, and when we realize that the reasons given to us to justify the actions taken are not rational, it means that these reasons are pretexts, false reasons, which serve to hide an unmentionable truth. This is the way of the evil one. Everything we're seeing unfolding in the world now and always is spiritual warfare. All of human history is a campaign. Well, basically it's a effort of the most holy Trinity to get human souls to be sanctified, to sanctify themselves and to make use of grace to be sanctified, to get to heaven, and a campaign by the enemy of man's salvation to see that they are lost, that they are damned, and also that they suffer as much as possible. This is the way of the evil one. When he tempts us, he lies to make us believe that he is our friend, that he cares about our good. Like a fairground peddler, the devil offers us his miraculous finds, his elixirs of happiness and wealth for the modest sum of our immortal soul. But this, like a swindler, he admits to say, of course, and most he writes it in small print in the clauses of the contract. In other words, he promises us all this happiness and wealth at the cost of our mortal soul, but he does, neglects to mention that, or it's only in the small print. Everything is a lie when it comes to Satan. The premises are false. Here's the premise. Your God oppresses you with heavy precepts. How often have we heard that? The promises are false. You can decide and get what you want. And everything is a lie also when Satan's minions are organizing to establish the dystopia of the new world order. We all know what utopia is. Utopia is like paradise on earth, right? Dystopia is the opposite. It's like hell on earth. Let me look at the chat stream, see if anyone's paying attention. Okay. Okay. 
Well, since we cannot expect the great reset conspirators to tell us clearly what their final goes, goal is, since it is something unmentionable and criminal, we can nevertheless reconstruct the means, the thought that guides their actions by knowing the principles that inspire their actions and backing them up with their own words. And we are also able to understand that the reasons given are only pretexts. And yet the pretexts, as they are presented, demonstrate malice and premeditation, for if their plan were honest and good, they would not need to disguise it with illogic, illogical and incoherent excuses. The fact that their logic and excuses are so illogical and incoherent is evidence that they are masking their true intents. What is this great reset? It is the forced imposition of a fourth industrial revolution that will lead the present economic and social system to implosion and will allow, through a general impoverishment and a drastic reduction of the population, the centralization of power in the hands of an elite of aspirants to immortality and world domination. They would like to reduce us to an amorphous mass of client slaves confined in boxes and perpetually connected to the network. Through the Great Reset, they want to erase Western Christian society in order to establish a liberal communist synarchy on the model of the Chinese dictatorship, in which the entire population is controlled and maneuverable at will, in a society inspired, if only in a small way by Catholic values, the financial power groups in the New World Order elite would have no place. Um, I'm, 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 it's, it's five pages long, and I've already edited it down to five pages, so I'm going to skip a little bit more. Actually, I can't skip too much more. I have to go back to this. Through the Great Reset, oh, I said that already. This should not lead us to believe that the opposition to Christian society is merely economically and politically motivated. In reality, what triggers this hatred is that there might be, even in the most remote, remote corner of the planet, a possible alternative to this globalist dystopia, a world in which the employer can honestly pay his employees, in which the state imposes reasonable taxes on his citizens, in which charities render services free of charge and without speculation, and in which the innocence of children is respected and LGBTQ propaganda is not permitted. A world in which the social reign of Jesus Christ is shown to be not only possible, but the best form of society administered for the common good and for the glory of God. Now I'm going to um, introduce the next section a little bit, to give it a framework to understand it. Uh, Vigano makes a very interesting point here that when somebody is trying to impose in a delusion on uh, basically, you know, a, a, a false vision on society, they cannot afford a, a single example of the truth, a single example of things that contradict it by functioning well and being benevolent. And that's why this, he says this, I'll get to it. That's why they have to make sure there isn't a single example in some corner of the world that contradicts their great reset paradise. And it's why, frankly, the, the new church has to, can't allow the Tridentine mass because the example of the truth gives the lie to the fiction. So if you're going to try to impose a fiction and have people to believe it, you can't allow a little corner where the truth is manifest the true vision is manifest and people see that because as soon as they see that they'll recognize the fiction in the rest of the scene in the rest of the tableau 
Okay, so here's Vigano saying it much better. The mere existence of a term of comparison is a burning disavowal of the globalist deception, showing its horror and failure. The lies about the need for lockdowns are disavowed by the evidence that where they have not been adopted, there have been fewer cases of serious illness than where closures and curfews have been imposed. Lies about the effectiveness of the gene serum are debunked by cases of reinfection of vaccinated people, serious adverse reactions, etc. The lies about the sovereign people and inviolable human rights have been debunked by absurd rules, unconstitutional norms, discriminatory laws in the silence of the judiciary. Even, and this is, this is the good part about the mass, even the term of comparison constituted by the mass of all time, that's the traditional Latin mass, makes it impossible to prefer its Montinian counterfeit. That's the Novus Ordo. That is why the Bergoglian church wants to prevent its celebration and keep the faithful away from it. To impose this horror on us, they have resorted to deception, telling the faithful that the apostolic mass is incomprehensible and that it must be translated and simplified so that the faithful may better appreciate its meaning. But this was a lie. And if they had explained to us that their aim was exactly the same as that which the Protestant heretics had set themselves, that is to destroy the heart of the Catholic Church, we would have gone after them with pitchforks in hand. I'll add a little comment here. If, in fact, the traditional Latin Mass was to be, you know, was, was disapproved of because it's inferior and people don't like it and people aren't going to be interested in it and they're going to get turned off from it, there'd be no reason to suppress it, right? Because it would die on the vine because nobody would want it. But if it was intrinsically more satisfying than the Nova Sorta Mass, then you've got to stamp it out. Because if you allow it somewhere, it's going to grow and people are going to become dissatisfied with the alternative. And in fact, the uh, parish where I am now, the FSSP parish, when I joined it, I think I was one of 30, 30 members of the parish, maybe 40. And now it's about four or 500, I think, and two families a week. Two families a week, new, new families a week are joining the parish. That's not evidence that the traditional Latin mass is unappealing and doesn't interest anybody. And by the way, I do also go to the new mass, the Novus Ordo Mass. <laughs> okay, um, here's the advantage of the Novus Ordo Mass. The advantage is there are no screaming children because everyone there is older than I am. Uh, whereas at the traditional Latin Mass parish where I go, it is like a Montessori kindergarten because there are so many young families and um, many of them bring their young children. So that, that's not really pleasing to me. I wish that they wouldn't uh, bring their children if they can't keep quiet. But it, sh it, shows, it shows where the objective appeal is, so to speak. Um, anyway, okay, back to Vigano. I'm not going to go on forever, by the way. I'm not going to get to the end of this letter. The globalist world does not tolerate comparisons. It demands this exclusivity, which it denounces with horror, as soon as it is not itself that claims it. It tears the clothes off the temporal power of the church, uh, and then demands absolute and irrational obedience to the dogmas it proclaims from Davos or Brussels. It celebrates freedom of speech and of the press, which it generously funds, but tolerates neither dissent nor truth, which it seeks to make inaccessible, invisible. Again, the globalist world has no past to show us to confirm the greatness of its ideas, its philosophy, its faith. Conversely, it lives by falsifying history, by erasing the past, by eliminating it from the new generations, so that there is no one who, in front of Chartres Cathedral, is able to recognize the images of Christ and the saints.
so that no one would know that in the Holy Chapel was kept the ampulla of the Holy Chrism carried by an angel to consecrate the kings of France, so that no one could know their deeds, find their tombs, or understand the treasures of art and literature that have made the Catholic nations great. The cancel culture reveals the radical, ontological inconsistency of globalism in the face of the splendor of Christian civilization. Okay, this is a very interesting little tidbit that Vigano is introducing. Why cancel culture? Why does the current Great Reset culture have to erase the past, have to erase history? It's because it has no, it has basically, since it's a lie, there's no, nothing it can point to in the past that justifies its current claims. Everything in the past contradicts its current claims. In other words, it can claim that somehow Christianity was oppressive and oppressed the people and, and you know, was a negative force for civilization. But if you look at Christian civilization, in the genuine Christian civilization in the past, you find art and beauty and culture that absolutely blows away the present culture and art and beauty, right? So obviously Christian civilization can't be inferior to the current technocratic Great Reset civilization, right? So it's got to erase the past. Uh, conversely, if you look at the past, the past of the Great Reset ideals, what do you see? You know, you see the uh, French Revolution guillotines, you see the Bolshevik Revolution and Stalin's, you know, mass murder of tens of millions. You see Mao, you know, and his, I think it was a hundred million actually that he killed in the, whatever you call it, the great, the great reset of red China. So they have to pretend that the past began yesterday because then there's no yardstick that you can hold up their claims to and see how false those claims are. That's why history isn't taught in school anymore. Um, you know, the, I mean, genuine history, but rather we get, you know what we get. I mean, we get, I, I, I don't want to, I'm on YouTube, I don't want to get too controversial, but we get very narrow slices of extremely ethnocentric history which is distorted or you have the whatever is called the 1619 project which is complete falsehoods about early american culture and legal system and so forth anyway continuing just for a couple of minutes the globalist world has no future or rather, the future it intends to give us is the darkest and most terrifying that the human mind can conceive. The future it presents to us is false and unrealizable. I don't have a house, I don't own anything, and I'm happy. Schwab and the promoters of Agenda 2030 try to convince us. That's a quote, actually, from one of their TV commercials or YouTube commercials. I don't own anything and I'm happy. You won't own anything and you'll be happy. But their, uh, but their aim is not to make us happy, which will not happen, of course, but to take away our homes and possessions. When they talk to us about pacifism and disarmament, it is not because they want peace, but because being disarmed and without ideals, we will let ourselves be invaded and dominated without reacting. By imposing welcome and inclusiveness on us, they do not want us to really welcome and integrate people from other cultures and religions, but they want to create the premises for social disorder and the consequent disappearance of our traditions and our faith. Um, I'll just skip to the last paragraph I think I'm going to read. If we are not persuaded of these realities, we cannot even understand the action of the enemy, who is perfectly... Oh, wait a minute. No, I'd better not. Modern society, with its fable about democracy, has taught us to think that we can possibly be, that, that we can possibly be Catholics, perhaps even traditionalists, as long as we do not question the fact that equal rights should be granted to anyone. 
We must respect the ideas of others, they tell us. But in the metaphysical sphere, in the eternity of God, this battle between good and evil is not secular or ecumenical. It is real, as are the armies deployed, that of the city of God and that of the city of the devil. The angels of heaven and the apostate spirits of hell have nothing to do with conciliar irenicism. They are waging a battle in which as many souls as possible must be snatched from the adversary. The saints who intercede for us have not read Fratelli Tutti, and St. Michael's scales are not calibrated to the case-by-case -case morality or situation ethics of a heretical Jesuit or to the pastoral contortions of the synodal path. In other words, there is actually objective truth, and that objective truth is what guides our eternity what determines whether we end up in heaven or hell, and what determines the outcome of battles between heaven and hell, battles between the armies of God and the armies of the devil, and battles between the good angels and the evil angels. They are not deluded by all of these socially popular myths about right and wrong and what should be and what should not be. The truth actually prevails in the actual underlying battle, which is a spiritual battle and which is not subject to these distortions and lies. Okay, continuing. If you are not, this is, I think, going to, who knows when I'm going to stop. I'm sorry. I want to stop by, by a quarter of. If we are not persuaded of these realities, we cannot even understand the action of the enemy, who is perfectly aware of this reality. If we are not persuaded of these realities, we will not set a credible example to those who, by our words and actions, might open their eyes and become compliant to grace. It is difficult to believe those who do not like what they profess, just as it is difficult to give credence to the modernists who, by their uncharitable behavior, disavow their empty words. In other words, their behavior gives lie to the empty words that come out of their mouth. I read uh, somewhere, some uh, very recently, a couple of days ago, somebody's father told them that politicians remember there's one thing politicians are good at, and that is convincing you that they believe what they want you to think they believe, that they are who they want you to think they are. That is where, what their skill is. It is impossible to believe those who ask us to eat grasshoppers and cockroaches to save the planet while they eat precious pieces of Kobe beef. Just look at how they behave at Davos or at these World Economic Forum conferences and what they eat. They're not eating cockroaches and, lo and locusts. They're, they're eating foie gras and Kobe beef. Or abandon the gasoline car while they travel in private jets. There are hundreds of them in Davos during the World Economic Forum summits. Literally true. We are to abandon our private vehicles, our private little, little four-cylinder, you know, Chevettes or whatever they are. Well, they because we have to save the planet and we can't burn hydrocarbons while they travel in private jets. I mean, really, can they possibly believe what they're trying to convince us of? Okay. Last paragraph for the tenth time. The globalist doctrine is essentially satanic because it is the most direct and implacable social and global application of the rebellion of Satan. We find in it that hybris, that defiance of heaven which classical civilization had wisely stigmatized and which brings us back to the rebellion of Lucifer, hybris the foolish pride of those who believe themselves to be like God and usurp the divine attributes leads science today to deny its vocation to serve the good in order to place it at the service of the new order to accomplish with technological progress what was unthinkable in the past to erase the separation between man and machine between his mind and artificial intelligence. Then he goes on, on along that branch. But I'm going to end here uh, I have the link to the whole thing. 
Okay, maybe I'll read one, one more paragraph. Such is the struggle between good and evil, which, since the creation of Adam, has also included human beings who are called upon to choose which side to take, because neutrality is already in alliance with those who deserve defeat. We know how powerful the enemy of the New World Order is and what his organization is. We also know what drives him and what he wants to achieve. But it is precisely for this reason that we know that his victories are only apparent and doomed to failure, and that our duty in this war was already won by the Crucified One, is to choose which side we want to side with and to fight, first of all by opening our eyes to the lies that the mainstream information makes us swallow. Understanding that there may be evil people who deliberately choose to side with Lucifer against God is the first step we must take if we are to resist the gigantic coup that is underway. These people are, in a sense, Satan's mystical body, an act to spread evil in the world and blot out the name of Christ, just as the mystical body of Christ, which is the Church, acts in the communion of saints to spread grace and glory in the name of God. Uh, there was actually a bad, a bad syntax in this translation, by the way. We know how powerful this enemy, this enemy, which is in the, which is the new world order, is. Okay, we know how powerful our enemy is, the new world order, and what his organization is. We know what drives him and what he wants to achieve. But it is precisely for this reason that we know his victories are only apparent and doomed to failure because the war was already won by the crucified one. The, uh, the syntax is actually totally ambiguous there, so I want to repeat that, um, substituting a little bit of syntax. Okay, that's it. Um, I'd like to end after 45 minutes. Um, there. Okay, he goes on. It's very well, well worth reading, and it's actually well worth uh, stopping and chewing over sentences, because not only uh, he does what I cannot possibly do. Um, not only is everything very, in, you know, incisive and and uh, correct, and he sees through things very deeply. But he's very witty. He's very witty. He's very elegant in his um, expression. Um, it's just, it's just, it, it's, it's beautiful. It's just beautifully written. It's beautifully thought through. It's got real wit to it and so forth. So by all means. With that, I am going to say goodbye. And I hope, <laughs> I hope I'm back on YouTube tomorrow or the next day and that I haven't gotten a strike because all I've been doing is reading you know, all reading. I hope, I hope this has been okay. But it's not like, you know, I've been, you know what I mean. I haven't been in your face with anything objectionable. Okay, thanks for watching. I'll go back to the opening screen. And uh, it's just so beautiful. I love uh, Father Ripiger for the same reason, to see the um, juxtaposition of what we're seeing unfolding on the world stage and the underlying spiritual warfare. That's what history should be. John the Baptist being beheaded is probably a pretty good example of the uh, juxtaposition, so to speak, of world history and uh, spiritual warfare, right? So, um, you know, kind of the collision of uh, politics and political power and the battle between Christ and Satan and just like in the case of John the Baptist beheading, what unfolds on the world stage may look like defeat, but in fact, it's victory because Christ has already won the victory. The devil doesn't win any real victories. The beheading of John the Baptist was not a, a final victory. It wasn't a genuine victory for Satan. And the crucifixion, remember uh, uh, um, Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ, the crucifixion, just, um, just put yourself in Satan's, Lucifer's position, right? 
Yay, I won. I won. I won. I crucified him. Oh, no. Oh, no. I just brought about his ultimate victory. The victory is always God's. The victory is always Christ's. And and Satan is always, a, you know, getting sucker punched and um, turning out that it turns out that what he thought was his victory is really his greatest defeats. So with that cheerful news and that cheerful picture, uh, I'll bring up the music and disappear. So let me bring up the music. <laughs> Okay, so there we 